We are only checking okay, the friends, public sir. audience. That uh, once Fine, that audience audio is clear, then the, we will will start. Your video is very clear oh. now. Video oh. is very Fine, clear sir. now. Audio is also clear. Shall Fine, we start sir. now? Yes, sir. Very good afternoon to everyone. Today we are on the tenth day, tenth uh, webinar, the day third from Gandhigram Road Institute, Dimitri University. As usual. We are having different different subjects every day, and this has reached uh, to a level of uh, international webinar status in just ten months period. Overwhelmed by the audience, thank you to everyone. Uh, in this webinar series, we have maintained that we touch the subjects in a very very different aspect, and we bring in very very eminent uh, speakers in each and every program. Uh, i really thank uh, dr k m annamalai our chancellor for giving us this opportunity to start this webinar run it successfully by hand holding us and guiding us our uh, vice chancellor professor madheshwaran our registrar professor v p r shivkumar they have given unconditional support to this uh, achievement of ours needless to say we are also thankful to our coordinator dr sandra pandian he is also supporting in this webinar every time whenever possible whenever needed he intervenes and he gets the things done in gandhika with this uh, on the third day of 10th webinar series we have a very special guest to be with us as a chief guest today and to deliver a lecture uh, we welcome you dr meenakshi bajaj uh, she is going to speak on the title of child nutrition a critical aspect of life during pandemic when we say this the pandemic we are in almost there in third wave and uh, we are told that uh, i am i am only on the media reports and so on and so forth it has been said that this is going to affect the children most so with this uh, situation i am sure this uh, webinar is going to be a very good lecture to listen and to maintain it in life very i'm thankful to dr minakshi bajaj who has come and joined us in this day to just introduce dr minakshi bajaj she has uh, she is uh, working in uh, tamil nadu government she is working as a nutrition dietitian and uh, uh, multi super specialty hospital in chennai uh, where she is working she is nec member of indian dietetic association she is nec member of association of dietetic educators in india convener of netpro pan in chennai member of board of studies department of food science and nutrition university of mysore member of uh, bariatric technical committee uh, that is tnhsp government of tamil nadu she was past convener of indian dietetic association uh, of chennai chapter she is former lec member of nsi chennai chapter from 2018 to 21 she is a former dietitian and coordinator of institute of dietology academy of clinical nutrition rg gh madras medical college chennai she is author of dietic metric handbook for food exchange in amazon flipkart and notion plus she is a uh, registered dietitian and uh, a, uh, almost 28 years of experience in clinical and uh, therapeutic nutrition uh, with the host of introduction i don't want to waste my time to uh, make our uh, chief guest to speak on this uh, subject uh, because if i have to speak about her i have to speak about volume of things it will take more time uh, let me introduce dr minakshi bajaj welcome to you ma'am in gandhigram program supreme to be thank you so much sir at the outset i am at the outset i am grateful to gandhigram rural institute the management as well as uh, you sir dr krishna kumar sir for the opportunity to be touching upon you know if i can if i hope to touch upon the lives of several children if if this lecture could be of any use to build up their immunity and protect themselves but one thing i would want to definitely make a clear cut note here is whenever we talk of nutrition you know nutrition plays a backbone in management of diseases prevention of diseases 
But in this COVID-19 pandemic, nutrition may not help us prevent COVID-19 pandemic. But definitely it will make us a warrior to fight across the COVID-19 pandemic. And with your permission, kindly allow me to share the screen. Please, ma'am. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, yes. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. One second. Sorry, I have muted my mic. Oh, yes, uh, is, is your visible. yes, yeah. sir. Oh, it okay, is visible. Sir. Thank you, so Thank much. you. Yeah. Yeah. Please, oh. please. So when we've been talking about the pandemic, you know, initially in the first wave, we had about four percent of the pediatric population being affected with COVID nineteen followed by 10 to 15 percent of the pediatric population affected by COVID-19 in the second wave. And in the third wave, you know, based on the projection from 4, 4 percent to 10 to 15 percent, it has tripled. But we cannot say the number which would which may affect in the third wave. So now keeping this in mind that, you know, there is an alarm bell which has been ringing all around us. Obviously, as Sir just mentioned that it's the media reporting which is telling us that it may be affecting the pediatric population. It's time for us to work now, better late than never. So when we talk of uh, my, just a moment. So with the stats of yesterday, if you see COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, as on July 2020, we had a number, we just keep looking at the number, 19198949494. This has been the total number of COVID cases. But thankfully, if you look at the recovery cases also are great, the death rate is low. But now when it comes to the pediatric population, you know, when we talk of mortality, the percentage is very, very small. So thankfully, it has not picked up the panic button in the first wave and second wave, but we do not know how the third wave is going to hit us. But in this first wave and second wave also, if you see, we've seen the children who have been immunocompromised, for example, those patients who had a renal transplant, or a lung or a liver transplant, or those patients who are suffering from cancer, those patients who are suffering from cancer, or those patients who are suffering from type 1 disease or HIV, wherein the immunity has been highly compromised, you find that we have found morbidity and mortality very high in those population only. You know, the percentage per se is very, very small. Now, when I talk of this, you need to understand that uh, the, these children are affected less when compared to the adult population. There is a small difference in the physiology of the human body, which in turn helps to protect the children from COVID-19 when compared to the adult population. Now, when you look at the malnutrition profile, obviously, when we talk of malnutrition, we need to remember both sides of the coin, the undernutritional status as well as the overnutrition status. Here, we know that if the uh, child is undernourished, he or she is going to have a poor immunity. That is why she or he may be affected or may be at risk of developing COVID-19. On the other hand, you will be surprised to even understand that, that when you are overweight and obese, there is a component of inflammation sitting inside the system. When there is inflammation, the immunity is compromised. And once again, you are at risk of developing the infection. So we need to have the double-edged sword, both malnutrition taken care of, including overnutrition and undernutrition. But when you look at the profile here, the malnutrition that is specific to the undernutrition profile, you will see that 189, 189.2 million undernourished people in India, they are both a population of the women as well as the children, in which about half of all the children in India, that is 60 million out of the 189.2 million, 60 million children are underweight. Then the, based on the percentage, you know, 45% of them are stunted, 75% of them are anemic, 57% are vitamin A deficiency, 21% are wasted. So this percentage, if you see, when we are projecting it to 2022, you will expect that is just in another one year, we will have 9.3 million children wasted and 2.3 million children stunted, which is now a very, very big worry. Now, not only the worries, you know, you would have seen in, uh, uh, thankfully in India, we have the midday meal scheme or the noon meal scheme, which was, uh, you know, started off way back by Dr. Kamraj and then followed by Dr. MGR and then obviously followed throughout the country. 
wherein they were for providing the supplementary feeding, midday meal, noon meal scheme to the school going children. Unfortunately, during this pandemic, though the ICDS center has been, you know, gracious to go door to door to provide the dry provisions to each and every child's family, obviously for the child. But what happens when it goes to the family, it may or may not reach the beneficiary that is a child in total. So the purpose of providing this to the child in the form of the noon meal scheme or the midday meal scheme in the school was not only for the dropout, but also to improve the nutritional status of the child. Keeping this in mind, we are understanding that this particular ration, which is going to the uh, you know households for the child, may not reach the child in total. So we are going to expect undernutrition. Second thing is economic crisis has been a very big, big way in India, which in turn has affected the procurement, whether the dry provisions or the wet provisions or the fruits, vegetables, basically nutritious diets has been compromised because of economic crisis. That has also affected the child's health. So we need to remember that nutrition and lifestyle should be a core component of any response plan, especially during a pandemic and especially keeping the marginalized groups or the vulnerable groups, the economically, you know, uh, lower socioeconomic status, even the lower, even the middle uh, socioeconomic status has been moving towards the lower socioeconomic status. So understand the numbers, the grime numbers, which are going to increase in the next few years. So access to nutrition has also been compromised. This we are very, very well aware of. Now, this is one end of the pendulum. The other end of the pendulum, the children are sitting on online classes and, uh, you know, the uh, working mothers are also working from home. They are not only working from home, they are taking care of the house, taking care of the families. The entire, the husband is also working from home online. Thankfully, now the lockdown has been a little eased off, at least in Tamil Nadu. But other places, some places there are lockdowns, some places there are rains, some places there is partial lockdown. So with this particular scenario, we are also seeing overnutrition walking in through the extra, extra consumption of ultra processed foods. It's not enough if I'm just going to say it, that the consumption pattern of ultra processed foods, foods has been on the higher side. We need some evidence to back the statement of what I'm saying. Not only that, I want to put into your, uh, you know, uh, uh, put, put across this particular message that, as I mentioned to you, the patients who have you know, uh, being affected with morbidity and mortality are those who are been immunocompromised. And apart from that, you know, there was a, a paper which was published in May 2020, as well as 2019 and April 2020, wherein we found that patients with chronic kidney disease were, you know, affected with COVID-19. The next came the list for those who were attending hemodialysis and third came the list of the renal transplant patients. So this was a paper from China as well as USA wherein they found that those patients with CKD on hemodialysis as well as transplant were more at risk of morbidity and mortality. Now when we are talking of nutrition, obviously we understand that gut health is very, very important and gut dysbiosis or gut health or gut microbiome has been one of the very, very uh, you know, uh, most searched word either it may be in Google or in medical dictionary in the past one to two years. We've been hearing about gut microbiota and good gut health in relationship to constipation, in relation to, to IBD, mental health, non-communicable diseases, as well as gut health. And last but not the least is one needs to understand that our gut comprises of 80% of the immune system. So our gut is directly related to our immune system. And if you understand that when you are going, not going to do clean eating, I mean to say you are going to indulge in junk eating, which is nothing but ultra processed foods, which are rich sources of fat, saturated fat, trans fat, salt and sugar. They in turn cause gut dysbiosis and allow opportunistic infections like pneumonia and COVID pneumonia and the cascade of the cytokine storm worsens morbidity and mortality in children. So our job here is, first is to protect our children. Second is, in case they get affected with COVID-19, it just moves off without morbidity and mortality. Most importantly, not getting stuck with opportunistic infections, as well as, uh, you know, COVID-19 pneumonia, which makes life very, very difficult for the parent, 
the child as well as the caregivers and obviously the medical team now remember that when we talk of all of this we want the gut to be healthy why do we want the gut to be healthy is when the gut is not healthy it leads to a leaky gut that's when there is bacterial translocation which in turns enter enters into the blood stream and worsens the situation so what has this pandemic actually brought the kids brought to the kids you know uh, i i wish santa claus brings gifts during christmas but then this pandemic has brought what to the kids now obviously as i've mentioned to you two ends of the pendulum one is under nutrition second is over nutrition under nutrition is deepening in the poorer countries food insecurity and poor quality diets has been brought about by pandemic whereas on the other side unhealthy food choices increased screen time in increased physical act inactivity has also crept in apart from that unfortunately i have also been hearing the parents telling us that in the name of online education they are also downloading certain game apps which in turn is preventing them from move away from the screen time even when the school is you know giving you a break from online uh, learning wherein you need to spend time reading or doing other physical activity or indulging in healthy activities that has not been happening because of this on screen games which in turn has also once again led to increased sedentary life and physical act inactivity now the conclusion here is all of us have to have a multi pronged approach in other words it has to be a multidisciplinary team taking care or intervening now if not now never i think thankful we are thankful to gandhi gram rural institute for taking this initiative to you know uh, plan ahead and uh, you know sensitize the population on the importance of nutrition and the pediatric population during this pandemic so we've had studies from italy from spain china chile colombia brazil talking to us that the increased consumption of potato chips red meat sugary drinks as well as sweet foods fried foods have been on the very very high whether it's between 6 to 18 years or better whether it is 12 to 17 years or 18 to 13 30 years of age group talking basically from the pediatric population to the adult population the population has moved from consuming healthy diet or the mediterranean diet which has been consumed in in, in italian regions into a unhealthy junk eating diet but at the same time when we look at in india what have been we've been seeing we've been seeing a lot of spice and condiment concoctions being you know moved a lot of food products have been developed with spices and condiments saying they are immuno boosters and they can help to build up immunity but everything is patient specific if there is a particular patient who is a type 1 diabetic patient unfortunately last year as early as in may the first uh, uh, child whom we lost you know uh, to covid 19 pandemic was a 17 year old uh, child who was brought to the hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis and we lost the child in less than 4 hours so that is the uh, graveness of this disease and we need to understand that it's important to choose on the right nutrition what do you mean by right nutrition everybody knows the fruits vegetables you know uh, they are healthy everybody knows that all the whole grains are healthy but it's important to understand that when you choose on spices condiments and immuno boosters there is something called acceptable daily intake or the upper limit because these foods also which are containing immuno boosters may you know uh, uh, worsen toxicity in terms that if somebody is on a polypharmacy or any child is on a already in, on a list of medications or a child is a type 1 diabetic already walking into diabetic nephropathy or a child is a renal transplant patient or a liver transplant patient wherein the patient is on an immunosuppressant and that particular patient is at risk of developing hyperkalemia these concoctions can worsen the situation we have had patients coming to us with 6.4 potassium 7 potassium after consuming these concoctions not only that we've also seen inflammation in the liver we've seen jaundice we've seen so many other little little complications walking in by these concoctions so understand that when these concoctions are consumed they are consumed based on acceptable daily intake now obviously i've told you that the children are going a base and uh, some recent papers which will tell us that the sports activity has been decreased by 2 to 2.3 hours per week screen time has in increased by almost 5 hours per day and in switzerland they showed that 37% of the children had continued to increase their screen time 
even after the lockdown was over unfortunately they've had sleep disturbances stress anxiety all of this also has been part of covid 19 obviously this i've already mentioned to you that the intake of unhealthy food has been high and these are the unhealthy foods which may affect your immunity definitely thankfully in india we we don't have to worry about alcoholic beverages otherwise in other western population we may have to start worrying about children entering into the teens who may consume alcoholic beverages which can also cause gut dysbiosis so obviously sleep disturbances stress anxiety is there this is the time wherein unicef says that 30% but lockdown resulted in 75 to 100% reduction in pediatric health as well as nutrition service i would also want to make a mention here is during the lockdown period so many of the inborn errors in metabolism patients we have lost their lives because they have not been able to come across to meet their routine you know healthcare uh, team whether it could be a nutritionist or the iem specialist for continued management of their iem unfortunately we would have lost so many children to that 15 to 50% disruption in vitamin a supplementation treatment of severe wasting promotion of i iycf and provision of micronutrient supplements to pregnant women as per robertson and colleagues 2021 this is the unicef data so decreased screening decreased counseling and increased malnutrition so all of these above things are going to affect the immunity of the child now if the child is going to have covid 19 so we'll move a little further i hope and pray that no child gets affected with covid 19 but in case you know let us be a little proactive and uh, hope to protect our children if the child is going to complain of fever headache tiredness fatigue or cough sore throat or some of the children develop chest myalgia you know in fact uh, yesterday somebody met me and they told me that one of their child had developed covid 19 and it was chest tiredness with a very very mild headache for almost one week after one week the child developed mild fever after the mild fever it took almost 4 5 4 to 5 days to develop very high fever and then the cascade of events moved on so similarly some of the very uh, uh, rarely these children also have complaints of uh, you know anosmia that is loss of taste or smell sometimes they develop a rash or or there is redness of the eye or congestion of the conjunctiva there could be oral ulcers or you know uh, if they have been in contact with somebody who has been positive sometimes they may remain asymptomatic also so it becomes very very difficult and each child will present little differently but we don't have to worry as much with reference to the first wave and second wave the third wave we are yet to understand now when it comes to mild disease obviously fever so throat rhinorrhea that is running nose cough diarrhea vomiting no fast breathing now if it's going to be moderate disease it's going to be add on with little bit of fast breathing and you will see that at room temperature uh, at room oxygen sorry at room oxygen the saturation is between 90 to 94% as against 100% once the child moves into pneumonia we see that there are you know grunting there is increased respiratory effort some of the children may land up with seizures severe diarrhea vomiting or they may land up with multiple uh, organ failure or multi organ dysfunction syndrome there could be thrombosis and the saturation goes less than 90% now uh, last but not the least is the child may also have mis which in turn you will find that if the fever is more than 3 days and there is rash alongside there is hypotension or shock or myocardial dysfunction which obviously only a cardiologist will be able to help you with or evidence of coagulopathy which a vascular surgeon or a vascular physician may help you with acute gastrointestinal problems any two of this along with fever for more than 3 days and a raise in the inflammatory markers like c reactive protein or the erythrocyte sedimentation rate and the child may not have any obvious you know uh, foci of infection like bacterial sepsis or streptococcal infection or staphylococcal infection along with that an rt pcr positive then we can probably define the child as going into mis in childhood now here we've been talking of masks what types of gloves what type of mac vaccine has been available not only for the adult population and they've been also doing a lot of research on which is which could be the best vaccine for the pediatric population i am not an expert in that but though i will definitely tell you how to build up your immunity how to attack your t cells 
B cells, killer cells, macrophages, neutrophils. How do we strengthen the entire immune system or the immune mandalam, which I could call it as? So is diet going to help us? Yes. Is there an evidence for it? Yes. Is a healthy diet available in our house? Yes. It's not available off the shelf or on foods which are not traditional, which are not local, which are not seasonal. Basically, I would say in a single word, anything which is processed, anything which is not natural, anything which is not home cooked, especially by your mother or your caregiver, I would say that that would not provide you the best of nutrition when compared to the home-based diet. So basically, nutritional deficiency is associated with impaired immune response, which could be sluggish. Especially, it could be cell-mediated immunity and the cytokine production, which in turn will cause the cytokine storm and the cascade of events. Now, what do we depend on for our immunity? Obviously, our genes play a role. Our exposure to the COVID-19 immunogen, diet, micro and macronutrients, and last but not the least is the gut microbiome. Now, how do we make our gut microbiome really healthy? You know, in Tamil Nadu, they use palayadu or they use pulichathair. That is also a source of probiotic. Now, probiotics are available in the market in several jars. I don't want to mention trade names. But remember, when these probiotics are available in several small concoctions, they may also contain sugar as a medium in that. So keep aware of that. You Why don't you choose on taking prebiotics like oats, garlic, onion in your cooking, apples, all these will help to synthesize probiotics, which in turn will make your gut healthy. Apart from that, obviously, we know there are a lot of micro and macronutrients and amino acids, which will help to build up our immune defense. Now, I want to tell a very small story here. In 2000 BC, when people were sick, whether it's the adult or the pediatric population, they used to say, you eat this root, you will become better. In 1000 AD, they said, root is heathen, say a prayer. It's better you say a prayer than having some root. Then gradually they said, no, no, prayer is very superstitious. Don't tell a prayer, drink potion. Then they said, no, no, no potion. Potion is nothing but snake venom. It is a poison. Avoid taking that. It's better you swallow a pill. Now, in 1985, we found that a lot of people started taking pills over the counter, you know, without a restriction over the pills being taken over the counter and landed up with resistant uh, to the particular infection, like, for example, tuberculosis. Suppose somebody is not having tuberculosis and you're going to take prophylactically medication for tuberculosis, you're going to land up with resistant tuberculosis. Like that, I'm just giving one simple example. So many n number of examples can be given over this. Now, then they said you take an antibiotic. After that, in 2000 AD said, antibiotic does not work anymore. Here, eat this root. We know in today's situation, the COVID-19 pandemic, we are yet to come across an antibiotic or an antidote, apart from the vaccine, which is available now. Yet an antidote is not so strongly available. So we need to depend and rely on our strengthening our immune system. So we talk of spices and condiments. They not only provide taste, they also help us to fight disease. Now look at this turmeric basil bread. If this turmeric basil bread is going to be prepared with turmeric, basil, ginger, pepper, great. But if it's going to be prepared with white flour or in other words, refined grain like maida, then your gut is going to remain unhealthy. So the purpose is lost. So when you're choosing on certain foods, you need to see actually what is the entire gamut behind the product which is being developed, which is being claimed to say that it is an immuno booster. So just don't go by words, go by evidence and go by somebody who has actually, you know, shared a lot of science behind preparing or serving that immuno boosting drink or food product. Now, if I'm to say as simple as, you know, one avla or one big avla, which may be as high as 10 grams may provide you 60 milligrams of vitamin C and the vitamin C requirement is met for a child, even for an adult for that matter. If you want to choose on vitamin C, you cannot say you have to make avla ka murabba by boiling the avla and then adding sugar or honey or jaggery or palm sugar because the vitamin C is going to be oxidized. So either you take avla or you take guava or you take capsicum or you take moringa leaves or you take tomatoes or you take citrus fruits, you need to worry to take them raw. If you take them raw only, you can meet the vitamin C requirement. Otherwise, the vitamin C is going to be oxidized when you are going to cook the foods rich in vitamin C. Now, when I say moringa leaves, 
you need to understand that moringa leaves if they are cooked they they can they contain a host of micronutrients for from the carotenoids polyphenols phenolic acid flavonoids alkaloids and containing antioxidant properties they contain iron calcium b vitamins fiber with which will keep your gut healthy if you are not going to cook it and add it to the chutney preparations whatever you are preparing and without cooking the chutney you can even reap the benefits of vitamin c for example when you uh, are going to take ginger which which has 400 compounds like gingerol shergol and active antiviral agents it has to be taken in such a way so that it does not worsen vagal reflux disease for those patients who are having ulcers or heartburn or gastritis they should avoid ginger now ginger can be consumed like ginger garlic paste in in your cooking or ginger chutney or ginger can be crushed and put in tea but i don't think tea is an ideal drink for for a child basically so in milk you could boil it and give it a small amount of ginger whatever an adult takes probably 50% of that could be taken as acceptable daily dose for a child but remember that if you want to give ginger you can give it in the form of a juice with a little bit of honey a little bit of tulsi leaves and uh, you can also uh, you know if the child does not like honey or lemon you can add avla juice so any uh, concoction like that could be prepared for the child and given was most importantly for a child we say coconut oil contains lauric acid and monolaurin so if you can give the children below 12 years of age who do not already have any cardiac issues or cholesterol or they are having any uh, you know uh, health related issues which is associated with saturated fat then you can give the child at least alternate days coconut oil or coconut milk or fresh coconut which will provide lauric acid and monolaurin which will act as an immuno booster now apart from that you can add just about ha one small pinch on alternate days of star anise star anise is a spice which is used usually in non vegetarian food to add flavor but remember that it contains limonene an important antioxidant like shikimic acid which also acts like an immuno modulator and has antiviral properties now garlic is another thing which can be used in your cooking but too much of garlic can give a migraine so keep uh, keep that also in mind and usually whenever you consume garlic for immunity you need to chop it leave it for 10 minutes allow the allicin in the garlic to be released for it to act like an immuno booster now when it comes to turmeric everybody is talking of golden latte turmeric milk or uh, uh, golden latte whatever you are consuming in milk you remember whenever you add turmeric you are taking the turmeric for the curcumin in the turmeric you have to add little bit of pepper so the piperine in the pepper will allow the curcumin in the turmeric to do its job and act like an immuno booster if you are going to give only turmeric without the pepper the purpose is lost now coming to omega 3 fatty acids which is also a very valuable immuno booster you need to remember that if you are going to give flax seeds because a lot of vegetarian people prefer taking flax seeds or fenugreek seeds or green leafy vegetables or uh, uh, walnuts in order to achieve the omega 3 fatty acids but whenever you take flax seeds not more than 1 teaspoon should be consumed by the child at the same time when you uh, dry roast the flax seeds and if you are going to powder it and keep large quantity outside at room temperature not refrigerated it may get rancid because of the presence of omega 3 fatty acids so grind very small quantity refrigerate it use it daily it will get over soon and it will not get rancid but if possible dry roast it and chew on it or add it to your idli batter dosa batter chapati dough or to your gravies wherein you can chew on the flax seeds so that the omega 3 fatty acids are available now coming to tulsi leaves i would suggest for the male male child he can take lesser quantity of tulsi leaves probably one or two tulsi leaves not more than that but for the female population you can use three to four tulsi leaves though they are a super source of antioxidants now when it comes to karanji ragam or kalonji seeds or uh, you know uh, the black jeera which we can call some of them call it that way also this also can help to build up immunity but it leads to diarrhea in some patients so i would say not more than 2 pinches start with 1 pinch a day if the child is able to tolerate you give it if not you can stop it if the child is able to tolerate 1 to maximum 2 pinches a day is more than enough that is nothing but 
kalonji seeds now another important thing which is very uh, you know uh, pediatric friendly or children friendly is the coco coco is a super source of arak value it is a very very high arak value and coco is basically found in chocolates we, i think you all know even the children will know about it so coco in any form if added to uh, the diet it has a very very high arak value but at the same time remember the dental caries so i would suggest to take uh, chocolates with nuts which will give you also uh, the zinc and the protein along with the coco which contains the uh, arak value as well as the zinc and help to improve the immunity but at the same time if it's taken in excess it's going to lead to dental caries and obesity so any food which has a very very high arak value it is going to improve or help in build up the immunity now these are certain of the antioxidant compounds present in our uh, common spices which need to be taken in acceptable daily intake as i mentioned to you if you look at this list you will look at the drumstick leaves have the highest arak value followed by turmeric then comes the cinnamon remember when it comes to cinnamon you should take the roll and not the bark and maximum 1 to 2 pinches not more than that should be consumed for a child and it should not cross more than 3 months after 3 months you should stop so as i mentioned to you the black cumin seeds coconut oil fenugreek seeds flax seeds walnuts all of them are a source of arak value now as i mentioned to you this is for the adult population what is the maximum daily intake i would suggest to go less than 50% when it comes to the pediatric population so that we keep the child safe some of them when they are taken in excess as i told you it can affect the weight it can affect the liver it can also worsen the potassium status in the system now when coming down to serious understanding that what are the nutrients which can help us build immunity you know several research papers have told us vitamin a d zinc selenium they play an important role whether it it is uh, you know immunomodulatory effect or uh, immune enhancing function it plays an important role now in this all these nutrients mainly they have found zinc selenium and vitamin d to play a major role now when it comes to the pediatric population we also include vitamin c and probiotics obviously vitamin a and we know it's available in a lot of fruits like uh you know your the mango season is almost waning off but papayas are, are available round the clock sweet potatoes are a super source of you know uh, uh vitamin a when we talk of vitamin a beta carotene when you take it along in the form of a boiled snack you squeeze some lime over it and consume it it can give you the pro vitamin a apart from that obviously we have the green leafy vegetables also containing beta carotene we have the uh, carrots all these are sources of vitamin a obviously milk and milk products are a super source of vitamin a we also have the organ meats which are a super source of vitamin a vitamin d when it comes to vitamin d we would suggest to choose on fortified vitamin d oil that could be the first thing second thing egg yolk fortified milk are also a source of vitamin d but if you can tell the children to you know play during the daylight between 11 am to 2 pm for about 10 to 15 minutes during their break time it will help to give the vitamin d required for zinc what we need to do is we need to soak the nuts overnight i could soak them roast them sprout them but the best thing to would be to soak the nuts overnight remove the skin especially when it comes to almonds and walnuts you really can't do that when you soak the nuts overnight the phytates present in the nuts you know are inactivated and allow the zinc to be available to the to the system which in turn can help like an immuno boosting mineral vitamin c i have mentioned in our probiotics i have already told you better to choose our prebiotics which in turn will help in the synthesis of probiotics so the prebiotics are like oats barley onion all the banana varieties they also help to synthesize probiotics but if the child is a type 1 we would avoid bananas or if you can choose on already probiotic yogurts which are available in the market which are slightly flavored you know which are uh, very friendly for the children they can be consumed or if you can have fermented curd overnight that also can give you probiotics now balanced nutrition is important foods rich in polyphenol also do their jobs so all the berries all the berries are a super source of polyphenol also tea but i would not suggest tea as a super source for the pediatric population unless the teens don't mind consuming on green tea but avoid honey sugar jaggery to the green tea can be taken not more than 150 to 200 ml for the pediatric population protein i nevertheless i do, i don't need to mention that 
that it needs to play a very very important role whether in preventing infection promoting recovery or wound healing or building up your immunity at the same time if the child is a type 1 child the protein requirement is high at the same time if they follow the food order first the protein then the fiber then the cereal portion they are consuming that also helps in good blood sugar control omega 3 fatty acids i have already told you it's a fenugreek seeds whole gram walnuts green leafy vegetables flax seeds fish which can give you the omega 3 fatty acids keep the gut healthy do clean eating avoid junk eating no don't ask for paneer but now the restaurants have opened so paneer butter masala dal makhani uh, you know a lot of cheese all these are going to be causing gut dysbiosis i've already mentioned to you about pre and probiotics vitamin c i've enough done enough mentioning on that so but i always remember better than eating oranges and citrus fruits is just one small avla that will do wonders give uh, finely chopped pineapple with finely chopped capsicum that's a different tangy taste of uh, you know of a salad with bountiful of vitamin c in it vitamin a i've mentioned to you vitamin b i've mentioned to you it plays an important role choose on fortified vitamin d fortified milk or oil or you know uh, obviously when the cod liver oil contains vitamin d egg yolks contain but egg yolk and cheese contains a very very small quantity so the best thing is to keep the child physically active if school allows them between 11 am to 3 pm for about 10 to 15 minutes expose 18% of the body that is the both the arms which will give you enough of vitamin d vitamin e is present in the nuts as well as the oil which you are using for cooking selenium is present in wheat zinc is present in wheat in cocoa we have some paper to tell us in 2010 that it did inhibit corona virus and artery virus rna but you cannot keep popping zinc pills you need to remember that choose on zinc rich foods unless and until one is landed up with covid 19 wherein the doctor may prescribe a zinc supplement but supplements have to be taken only on the prescription of the pediatrician not on our own so better to rely on nutrition in the early stages than when it comes to the therapeutic dose obviously the last word is that of the pediatrician or the treating physician so obviously sprouted wheat sprouted whole gram soak soya beans the same seeds almonds cashews cocoa cashews and pistachios also contain resveratrol which also are immuno enhancing hydration is very 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 important it helps to relieve congestion flushes out toxins prevents dehydration it's very very important for at least those patients who have mild covid or moderate covid hydration is a key for management so drinking warm water you know if you are grown up probably green tea or herbal tea or even infused water warm milk butter milk if you are having a cold and a cough avoid you know refrigerated curd or butter milk in case of those uh, children who are type 1 you can choose on diabetic specific nutrition supplements the warm vegetable soups which are freshly prepared not instant soups freshly prepared rasams all these are concoctions which can be prepared and served at home keep warm water always with you remember when it comes to nutrition it starts in utero so the pregnant mother has to have a balanced nutritious diet once she delivers whether she is covid positive or covid negative or the child is positive or negative breastfeeding goes without saying as the best feeding and always when it comes to those children who are immunocompromised with some comorbidities they need to have their diet specific based on assessment it has to be tailor made and it has to be practical so continue breastfeeding you know as the age increases for the child whatever may be the uh, gamut of foods which are available to us all food groups have to be included there is no escape whether it's cereal pulses whole grams vegetables fruits everything has to be included in order to have a balanced diet because all these vitamins minerals work in synergy with the macronutrients in order to give the best benefit of healthy uh, you know uh, immune system so whether it's a toddler or whether it's an infant or a preschool or a grown up child one needs to remember to include all the food groups we cannot go without it the second thing if the child is having diarrhea and vomiting the diet is going to change obviously there we are going to talk of suppose there is diarrhea we are going to talk of apples suppose there is vomiting we need to remember ors even with diarrhea we need to remember ors we cannot manage without those things so that is the time when we may not have to provide the child with vegetable or green leafy vegetable or whole grains that time we may have to think ara ara root kanji 
or uh, rice flour kanji or soft easily digestible food but as the symptoms worsen you need the help of the pediatrician you cannot wait to take their help now when it comes to the recovery phase immunity has no passport when immunity has no passport you need to still continue the immune healthy nutritious diet for the child even then because this is the time during the covid 19 uh you know infection the child may have lost few kgs of weight we need to regain the weight the child would have lost some nutrients because of diarrhea vomiting poor appetite we need to get back and replace all those nutrients so it's time we get back to all the five food groups again every meal should be not only energy dense should be nutrient dense it should be small and frequent and if the patient is having diarrhea you cannot give milk and milk products you cannot give heavy seasonings that time you'll have to only think of simple khichdi idli simple food like that or curd rice or clear soups if suppose you found that the child was constipated not doing very well then you need to really remember to provide lot of greens lot of whole grams lot of whole grains and the child must continue to drink lot of water now depending on whether the child is having a mild infection moderate infection or severe infection the calorie requirement will keep stepping up the protein requirement will keep stepping up the carbohydrate requirement usually is between 55 to 60% for mild for moderate we will keep it to 55% for severe infection depending on the patient's oxygen saturation the carbohydrate may be adjusted and the protein may be picked up from as low as 2 grams per kg body weight to as high as 3.5 grams per kg body weight and when it comes to the fat between 25 to 30% should be the fats the better the fat would be you know the higher would be the mono unsaturated fatty acid followed by the poly and then the saturated fat and last but not the least keep the trans fatty acids on the low whatever it may be said and done when we talk of concluding on covid 19 we need to remember that there is no single food or single nutrient which can help to build up your immunity is a it is a concoction of all the macro and micro nutrients which taken timely and regularly will help to build up our immunity now last but not the least we need to remember that there is a lot of research done on long covid unfortunately uh, a lot of patients have been complaining of the symptoms persisting as though as 6 weeks to as high as 6 months they continue to have persistent cough myalgia loss of appetite some of the patients even still complain of for up to more than 3 months also they complain of anosmia that is loss of taste and loss of smell apart from that they need a lot of psychological support so some of them require social services support rehabilitation mental health support long term monitoring some of the children not the children i've seen the adult population walking into acute kidney injury or stroke or reinfected with covid 19 i'm yet to see uh, the pediatric population as much so in case of supplementation above the rda that has to be done only by the pediatrician or the consulting physician it should not be taken on your own so the best thing would be we need to screen the child we need to assess the child and we need to counsel the child accordingly because low income families presented the lack of access to drinking water and adequate food whereas the upper income families were able to monitor and dedicate themselves to feeding their children showing healthier dietary patterns it's time we acted the right way so sms kiya kya remember to wash your hands wear your mask keep social distancing and remember to remember god god is g for guava garlic ginger in your food o is for omega 3 fatty acids from walnuts fenugreek seeds from whole grams and green leafy vegetables d is diet diet prepared at home a healthy diet and not to uh, forget that remember that a balanced diet would always mean for somebody at least who is infected with covid and is recovering five servings of fruits and vegetables a day at least three servings of any source of protein it could be beans it could be pulses it could be whole grams or it could be nuts and three servings of dairy to get into your diet on regular basis in order to build up your immunity on the peak so put a smile on your face today and every day admire it in the mirror remember to wear your mask when you move out wear it proudly a smile will open doors and dialogue i wish very soon we are able to be without mask but till then 
remember that we expect miracles to happen. So wear a mask, hide your smile initially, and later on we'll, we'll be smiling all our lives. Thank you so much for the patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Meenakshi ji. Uh, yes, sir. I should say that it is 360 degree coverage. You have never ever left us to ask something. You have explained everything. That's the kind of thing. <laughs> it is really Thank great. Thank you so much, sir. It's a really great presentation, I should say. Uh, which will be Thank very, you so much, sir. Very, very useful for the people, those who are uh, studying in uh, home science or uh, uh, food, uh, food science. Definitely, this is going to be a library material for them. I'm sure this is going to happen. Uh, certainly, uh, this kind of presentation, one uh, such uh, program needs to be done in Hindi uh, to reach out to larger population. Uh, sure, I will yes, request sir. you to come once again. I, I will request sure, Taj, sure. Dr. Tahira to help me in getting <laughs> you in Hindi presentation. Uh, sure, this, yes, sir. this is something very, very important now. Uh, because we have to reach other uh, other states also where uh, you are comfortable in Hindi and uh, this is going to help. Now we have come up with English. This will reach to uh, some population and most of the population may have been left. Those people will get benefited out of this. I am sure, really, yes, really very happy. Now, Thank you so much, uh, sir. The question answer session, we are flooded with questions. I am uh, I'm having questions of uh, uh, a student from Indira Gandhi University. Uh, and then yes, the open is the Ikno yes, Mahalakshmi is there with uh, bullet questions. Anyway, I'll come down. Uh, yes, first, first question comes to uh, comes from me. I would uh, prefer a couple of questions. Uh, you please answer in your amateur business schedule. Uh, the first thing what I what comes to my mind is in COVID, the most affected uh, people uh, are due to respiratory problems. Sorry, sir. Respiratory, respiratory health. Respiratory. The respiratory tract is affected and you yes. land up with poor, low saturation. Yes. But if you are having asthma, bronchial asthma, you are at a very high risk. But apart from that, when your immunity is compromised, it could be, as I mentioned to you, liver transplant, renal transplant, hemodialysis, chronic kidney disease, HIV, bronchial asthma. All these come under that category who are at risk. But apart from that, if the child is undernourished, low birth weight, wasted, stunted, they are also equally at high risk. Now, uh, apart from this category, now I am talking about uh, kids, uh, those who are uh, below 5. I am talking of children only, children. sir. Okay. Okay. Ah, children have had liver transplant, renal transplant below 5 years of age. <laughs> That's really uh, very, very difficult to have. Hey, and okay. Unfortunately, I lost my nephew who is a post-transplant kid. Right. Lost him to COVID. So okay. there are so many children who are having cancers who have lost their life because of COVID. So it's the immunocompromised population. So those children who are underweight, stunted, wasted with bronchial asthma are also equally at a high risk. It's a very uh, difficult situation now. Anyway, now I'm, I'm coming to the second question. Um, we have our own traditional food, pro, uh, food preparation methods. Indian food has its own mirch, masala and everything to, to see to it. Now, I am having a typical situation. You have touched that subject. The newborn's mother is very vulnerable. Sometimes uh, she may be affected with COVID or if someone is affected with COVID and the breastfeed is given to the child. What kind of... Uh, uh, Precautions she should take or, or food. There is no vertical transmission, so she should continue breastfeeding. But how does she continue breastfeeding? Because she's got COVID-19. She has to wash her hands. She has to wear a mask. Suppose she's having moderate to severe infection. She has to express her breast milk. So that is important. And in order to recover, she needs to take an immunoboosting diet, which may become slightly difficult if she is moving from moderate to severe, because some people who are moving from moderate to severe, the oxygen mask is on, unfortunately. When they remove the mask, their saturation dips. So they cannot even remove their mask to eat or drink. So that's when nutrition becomes even more difficult. So that's when they, they put an enteral feeding tube to feed the mother so that the mother does not land up with dehydration and acute kidney injury. You know that small phase of 24 to 48 hours, she's dehydrated because she's not able to 
remove our mask and drink. You want to imagine the patient is not able to use the toilet. By the time she goes to the toilet and comes back, her saturation really drops. So those situations are very very delicate for suppose a mother who has just delivered and who has been COVID nineteen positive. If she is moderate or severe, if she is mild, nothing to worry. She can continue her normal healthy diet. Do her precautions in term of mask. Protect the child. Wash her hands well and nurse the baby. There is no vertical transmission of COVID nineteen. In fact, the breast milk has lot of immuno enhancing properties. Which no other formula feed will provide. That's a great. Thing. That's a great. Thing. I'm really thankful to you for this kind of explanation, ma'am. Because these are all certain things which are not told to uh, many, and many people are not able to listen to it. We have uh, in Gandhi Gram University, we have uh, lab to land program wherein our student goes to rural uh, uh, villages. That's amazing. Village. So they used to tell what needs to be done in terms of sanitation, in terms of health. And in terms of uh, healthy practices, so this. In this fact, is... uh, I would want to make a comment that I've already seen the child development project officers, the CDPOs who are working in the ICDS centers. Eighty percent of them are from Gandhi Gram University, and I used to wonder. Really, I used to wonder what are they teaching in Gandhi Gram University that eighty percent of them are sitting as CDPOs, which is a proud moment for me to hear. that you are sending your children to go into the rural area to actually understand their ground reality and work accordingly yes that's hats yes. off to you this is this is a practice which has been done for years together right from the inception of the institution uh, the institute has three type of things to do in which it is important to have uh, lab to land program that is their village visit they have it's compulsory to go to that's villages. amazing it's compulsory to go stay there With them, with the village people, oh. understand. But they really reality. understand the ground reality, absolutely, absolutely. and then they can act accordingly. That's that is the reason. That is the reason the output is better than anyone. So, reading in books and being in practice. So I was practice. wondering always what is the syllabus, but now I know <laughs> what is the real syllabus. So, I am sorry to disclose the curriculum of that. No, 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 no. I. <laughs> it's a good thing. No, at least we should tell that this is the plus point of Gandhi Gram University. Yes. That they are yes. simply not walking into as a CDPO. There is yes. a reason behind it. Yes, this is the reason because when they go, they sit with the villages, they sleep with the villages, they eat with the villages, they live with the villages. After one month or twenty days, they when they, when they come back, they understand better what what kind of uh, need is there and how to develop that. And most of our uh, uh, our uh, uh, research is done on that basis. Hmm. That is the reason uh, it's coming up very nice. Hats off. Uh, it, this this is there. Uh, hats off to our founder members, Dr. Soundram. Hmm. Uh, she herself is a physician, and uh, Dr. Okay. G. Ramachandran. They, they, this is their vision. The Mahatma Gandhi's vision to reach to uh, rural villages is what made this institution as a unique institution. Whenever I go and talk to people uh, in, in ministry uh, or in UGC, this is what they like. This part of it is untold. No paper can explain them what they are doing at the grassroots level. Now we'll continue with the questions, ma'am, because uh, yes, it's very, very important now uh, to have certain questions which has come from specifically uh, Mahalakshmi. I would like to uh, add yes, one, sir. two, three, four questions as there, ma'am. Now, yes, sir. Uh, you have touched upon tulsi leaves, and you have made a specific comment on uh, two to three to boy, baby boys and four to five to. Uh, yes, I did not want to make it a very big uh, noise because I usually make that noise in adult population. It interferes with spermatogenesis. That is why I did not want larger quantity to be given to male children. Okay, that's fantastic, ma'am. Because that was the question. Why? <laughs> okay, now children are smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> True. That's why these students are asking this kind of question, right? It's great, great to have this question, ma'am. Uh, now. How to reduce the prevalence of child obesity during pandemic? Does the child need caloric reduction? If it is yes, then how much? Uh, how much? Uh, how much calorie per day? See, basically, when we tell that the child is overweight or obese, I would never touch on nutrition. I would first thing touch on his physical activity. You step up the physical activity by half an hour to forty-five minutes. Obviously, you will see the weight reduction happening. Second thing, look at the twenty-four hour recall or the food journal or the food diary and see how many biscuits have gone in. That's the commonest thing which no mother even bothers to tell. 
she will not tell but actually the child would have finished one whole packet of 50 50 or crack jack or good day cashew unfortunately i am mentioning these names but one packet of good day cashew will be over or uh, i don't even know the names like bourbon with cream and all that one full packet will be over that is not counted as calories that is not counted as junk food they think it's part of their normal diet if they replace that simple thing with one fruit or a handful of nuts that will do the wonder third change which they need to make is if they want to give a fried snack it has to be prepared at home for two reasons one is there will be a control on what the child is eating second is no reheated oil otherwise reheated oil is used which leads to cancer and other non communicable diseases so that's the second point third thing is is the child chewing and eating that's they are gulping they are not nourishing their body they are just gulping the food inside not nourishing the cell and the mind and the body they need to nourish their mind cell and body they will never be overweight and over so the mother has to prepare the food second thing it can be prepared color color what color do you choose with naturally colored fruits and vegetables the child needs to chew and eat and cannot watch television and eat then he is not eating he is only watching television and whatever the child is eating god only knows what the child is eating so you need to cut down on the sugar cut down on the fat make the fat healthy fat choose on nuts you know if the child is hungry don't look at junk keep one fruit or a handful of nuts to the child the child will automatically 3 days 4 days 5 days get into the habit how did we get into the habit of brushing our teeth daily because the mother told us you need to brush your teeth daily so like that if the mother is going to give daily one packet of chips or a packet of biscuit the child is going to ask for that only i would uh, instigate the mothers a little more than the child it's really a uh, great thing to hear from you like this it's very simple very simple you have explained everything but as now i have a supplementary question from, uh, <laughs> in this case but no bread you should keep bread away from home sir that's one other thing no bread corn flakes wheat flakes no instant food yes instant is food is having a list of uh, annel the ingredients which are not seen to the naked eye absolutely you are very it's very well said now now i am coming to uh, child uh, children those who are uh, uh, having means i have seen couple of uh, children i have heard couple of children having constipation uh, right at one year or two year or three year uh, because of the food habits is there any sort of uh, 100% sir if the child is formula fed the child is going to be constipated If the child is breastfed, the risk of constipation is lower. Okay. Risk of inflammatory bowel disease is lower. Okay. Second is the child is not fed enough water. Okay, water is the basic. Yes, water is important. Now, how much water is a question? Hmm. Keep the color of the urine colorless. Okay. So whenever the child is passing urine, she, she or he should ensure that the color is colorless. If it is not colorless, that means it's concentrated. Hmm. When it is concentrated, you are at a risk of constipation. Okay. The third okay. thing is the child has to be minimally physically active. Only then the gut is going to move. Only then there is going to be bubble movement. Okay. If there is no okay. bubble movement, you are going to be constipated. Okay. The third thing is vegetables. You know, most children what they do, you put some mixed vegetable rice also and give it. No, they will remove the onion, yes. the peas, yes. the tomato. All what I tell them, tell the mothers, whatever vegetable you have in your house, cook, turn, cook, blend it in the mixer, add it to your dosa batter, add it to your chapati ka atta. and prepare a chapati or prepare a vegetable dosa so the vegetable is going to go inside you are going to give sambar you are going to give dal no problem blend the vegetable in the mixer add it to your dal the vegetable will go inside after hiding doing this hide and seek with the child one point one day the child has to eat vegetables and greens so that you have to insist usually when they are toddlers we tell them five family members are there from each family member take one by or one handful one mouthful so the child is going to eat what grandmother grandfather mother father sister everybody has eaten one mouthful that is going to be enough to give enough fiber and taste to the child the child is going to develop a habit if you are not going to develop a habit while eating and while serving you cannot expect the child bread biscuits apples they constipate so if you are going to give whole grain like ragi samay tinai varg kel varg little millet finger millet all the millets which are forgotten if you give them child is never going to be constipated but you have to hydrate the child child has to chew child has to eat vegetables and greens otherwise child is going to be constipated initial constipation later on is going to go to lead to cancer of the rectum cancer of the colon 
because inadequate fiber intake the simplest example is constipation it's a worst disease now when you are a child the mother feels bad oh the child is taking so much of pain while passing a stool yes but when the child yes. becomes an adult he is not going to tell anybody i am constipated yes. it is going to be an hidden agenda in his mind he feels shy even to go to a doctor and tell i am constipated thank you ma'am it's really good good uh, this is a beautiful idea that you just uh, crush it add it give it you can't so see it only you can't yeah. see it yeah. but it's added to your food yeah that's all child that's cannot see it is going to take but you can't do it all your life one day you have to get over it thank you so much ma'am now i am coming to mahalakshmi's question children who suffer from celiac disease and during this pandemic as the supermarkets were closed and only the basic ingredients are available uh, what to do as in this kind of situation see celiac disease is you do not want any gluten to walk into your diet gluten is present in biscuits it's going to be present in bread it's going to be present in contaminated oats it's going to be present in barley you are going to keep out of it replace it with millets and rice what is difficult about it it's not difficult okay your okay. choice of food which you have to remove and which you need to add only you need to worry celiac disease is autoimmune so your immunity is compromised so be aware that you provide fruits and vegetables they don't contain gluten they are not going to trouble the celiac disease child at all thank you ma'am thank you it's going uh, even more interesting because i have never studied uh, i did my engineering then economics and business administration <laughs> and uh, doctor mm -hmm. but unfortunately this has become a very important and very interesting subject for me also now going to the next question ma'am Uh, lactose intolerance is one thing which is very very important in, uh, in, in these days. Let's let's uh, see it. how do a layman or a parent, those who are uh, those who are not studied or those who are not educated, how do they identify uh, this lactose uh, intolerance with children? I will tell you. I am educated. I am a nutritionist with 28 years of experience. With 14 years of experience, when I delivered my daughter. at the age of 2 and 1/2 years she had diarrhea every weekend abdominal pain diarrhea nothing else every weekend because as a mother i get holiday on a sunday and i overfeed my child with the milk and milk products okay for 2 and 1/2 years i was roaming door to door to find out what was wrong with my child after being educated in nutrition because 2 and 1/2 years i fed her breast milk she was doing perfectly well the moment i moved to formula feeding and to cow's milk and other forms of milk on a sunday i get little more chance to feed one more glass of milk extra to the child which i did not identify or one piece of cake or one sweet dish prepared with the milk because child is two and a half years old i can feed the child anything i want to prepare at home my love fed her more milk and i it took me another two years to identify that it was lactose intolerance not two years i think i almost one year to identify because i came to realize that at the only on a sunday why is it happening so many people told me maybe it is lactose intolerance i am like how can lactose intolerance come only on a sunday why not on uh, monday to saturday but then i realized i am the culprit i used to feed her extra milk and extra milk prepared dishes so which actually showed the lactose intolerance so when i went to the gastroenterologist and she said you have to identify and tell me what is troubling your child i cannot tell you what is troubling your child so the mother is the best pediatrician best gastroenterologist to identify what is wrong with the baby that is point number 1 she identifies and confirms the diagnosis with the doctor doctor does not do the diagnosis the mother does the diagnosis and the confirmation is done by the pediatrician if she is an observant mother she can easily identify what is troubling my child my child had unfortunately a dermal dermatitis dermatitis issue whenever she consumed a laddu which had a yellow color laddu to we are not preparing at home some puja is happening somebody is offering prasadam and they are giving a laddu she would develop allergy and later on we came to know no the pediatrician helped me identify it was color allergy so if you have anything with yellow color even the sambar if you go and eat in a hotel i do not know what turmeric powder is using so if he has added some color to the turmeric powder she will develop the allergy so this a mother is the best diagnosis person 
or even the child if the child is grown up child will tell you i am eating groundnut it troubles me the day i eat sago it troubles me initially it was very difficult for my for me to hold my daughter and tell her don't eat this this has got lactose it will trouble you baby don't have this now she'll tell me mama i don't want to have this this troubles me so i don't want to have it so first it is the mother then it is the child herself or himself will tell you that i am troubled with this i don't want to have this she will tell you but you have to be a keen observer and listener you should not uh, run away from the complaint what the child is telling don't think the child is nagging listen to the child attend to the child's complaint and understand if that is there is some seriousness in it not always a child will unnecessarily complain child is not uh, you know taught to complain unnecessarily especially when it comes to the health and symptoms so as a mother be patient attend to her listen to her or him you will get the diagnosis and confirm the diagnosis with the pediatrician before you do the confirmation maintain a small food diary delete that food which is troubling the child you can spot the diagnosis that's great great to supplement this is not a question it's supplementing i just had some some interesting thing which has you have mentioned the color about the color of laddu uh, there was a birthday of a child which is of maybe 2 or 3 years and uh, uh she was playing around here and there and uh, mingled with the other kids and so on and so forth after some time the cake cutting was there the moment the baby saw the cake she started crying and in, in high volume no one understood what is the problem Why? now i understand that the color is the problem <laughs> <laughs> because her grandfather uh, suggested that some cake that the, this color should be there or that Mm. that irritated that uh, baby child and uh, started uh, making havoc <laughs> okay. it's really g- great ma'am now uh, i am coming to the last question again from mahalakshmi yes sir <clears throat> mahalakshmi it seems uh, i love uh, she should have been in this uh, forum to ask this question to you directly uh, she has sent another question now india as a uh, as a country if you see the uh, because of the population or because of any reason uh, different reason whatever it may be india being high on diabetes in adult population these days and children are more prone for high hba1c as well uh, what are the dietary intervention which can be adopted at home without taking medical support is what the question see if the child is in the pre diabetic status if the child is in the pre diabetic status wherein the hba1c is between 5.5 to 6.2 the child is pre diabetic if the child is going to lose weight 7% of the present body weight she can reverse the pre diabetic status to non diabetic status we are seeing lot of children 12 year old child 14 year old 16 year old 18 year old with pre diabetes with pcos if we just help them step up physical activity reduce 500 calories from present caloric intake we can reverse pre diabetes to non diabetic but if the child is type 1 diabetic you cannot do anything you have to give insulin if you don't give insulin you will kill the child this is open license to kill the child but not giving insulin to the child you need to give insulin to the child if the child has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes if the child has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes depending on what in how much duration the child has been and what is the hba1c level you cannot ignore and say we will not put the child on uh, you know bigonides and leave the child to just lo- uh, ruin the organs you know have micro and macro vascular complications because in type 2 diabetes you will see micro and macro vascular complications walking in at time of diagnosis itself you don't need to wait for 5 years 10 years for those complications to come up but in a type 1 child the complications will take long to come down to come up and to be visible to you but in a type 2 you can see it at onset so depending on the patient's situation on the hpa1c you have to consider to choose on the right endocrinologist or diabetologist to treat the child in the worst of treating the child if the child is obese it is easy to some extent to move from early diabetes stage to a pre diabetes and to a non diabetes stage but if the child is at a duration of 4 year 5 years already on a double combination of tablets 
I don't think you can do a home remedy and treat the child. I think that will not be safe. It will be dangerous. In the pre-diabetic phenomenon, hundred percent you can reverse it to non-diabetic status. No, I'm coming. No. Back. I'm supplementing this uh, question of Mahalakshmi. Uh, is it possible with uh, dietary control to go back from uh, this uh, tablet mode, not insulin tablets? Uh, at the at the early stage, is it possible with the? Yes, definitely in early stage it is possible. Okay. In early stage, I have seen patients with seven HbA one C mm. who have been diabetic for six months, eight months period. You know, who have had unhealthy dietary practices, unhealthy lifestyle. They have modified their lifestyle, lost a lot of weight, reversed their seven HbA one C to five point five HbA one C. I have seen it. and there is something called meal replacement and a direct remission direct trial uh, in which we have seen remission for up to 2 years with meal replacers also they have replaced meals with isocaloric uh, portion controlled calorie controlled meals which in turn has helped to reverse diabetes for a period of 2 years so it's possible <laughs> it is possible if the duration of type 2 diabetes is 6 months 1 year i'm sure it's possible thank you that's a great news for many people because today it is an understanding given to everyone all the or the doctors are suggesting uh, they are saying that it is not possible at all to go back early stages is possible early stage it is still possible okay okay that's interesting Now, but one thing i would want to make a mention here before i forget this covid has landed up with something called new onset diabetes due to covid because of covid there is a direct attack on the pancreatic cells and so many children have developed a diabetes new onset diabetes because of covid so beware if any child gets covid to keep monitoring them for their blood sugars apart from that when children uh, i do not know about children as much but adult population is put on a lot of steroids so they also land up with uncontrolled diabetes if in the pediatric population also if there is uh, you know use of steroids then you need to keep the sugars under check you need to keep that blood pressure under check thank so you. you need to monitor thank basically thank you constant monitoring will help to uh, yes surely precaution yeah. surely thank you thank you so much no there is one more question from mark this is something very very important i see uh, can spirulina being a single cell protein uh, and being on 7% protein Uh, be given to the children at younger age than uh, five years. Yes. Yes, that's one word answer. Fantastic. Uh, can can two, less than two year child uh, be administered stevia or given stevia? Stevia. No. 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 Thank you. So now we are coming uh, to the fag end of the day. i don't want to take much of your time ma'am uh, you have come uh, amidst your busy schedule uh, you have been kind enough brother to be with us in this webinar i uh, half hearted closure is given for the webinar <laughs> <laughs> it's really a half hearted closure we need to close this session because of the time limit we have asked from this uh, uh, the system uh, i am really thankful uh, to meenakshi ji I mean, Akshay Bajaj, for being with us in this uh, webinar series, uh, for delivering a fantastic uh, lecture on child nutrition, a critical aspect of life during pandemic. Uh, really, this is going to be a library material for the people those who are studying, and this will be an eye opener for many of the uh, parents who are looking at uh, child care. And uh, this is going to be very, very informative for the people those who are listening. Like, including me, I have also learned so many things from this. particular webinar session i should be thankful to you for being with us i'm grateful for the opportunity sir and uh, it's not only one i am going to request once again tahiram uh, dr tahira to bring you in this webinar series once again with the same subject in hindi so that we reach out to most of the population in hindi also this is something very very important sure, sir. Uh, i thank all the viewers those who have been with us and uh, particularly i would like to thank uh, uh uh great friend mahalakshmi for being uh, very attentive in so many webinars i have seen her questions but this time uh, this questions are more uh, more uh, it has add added value for this particular webinar session i would just make a make a last mention sir stevia 
or any artificial sweetener causes gut dysbiosis. That is why I said avoid no. artificial sweeteners. Yeah. That's it. And this is not the time in COVID pandemic to worsen our gut. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, somebody says gut feeling. This is what is gut feeling. <laughs> I'm really thankful to you. I'm thankful to all the viewers. I'm I'm thankful to Dr. Fahira for being such a brilliant uh, speaker uh, who can deliver something. Uh, you you have always spoken about uh, food, but it is in capsule. Okay, thank you. <laughs> your so your experience in capsule. That is, you have thank capsule you your experience in this, and it was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for so being much. with us. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah. We have a